Hi, everybody. Welcome to another uh, episode of Beyond the Opera. We've got the amazing Sarah Fisher joining us today. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Sarah, Kim, you haven't met before, have you? So it's a good chance for you to say hi. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. So happy that you're here. Um, you were obviously at the top of the list of recommendations from both Andrew and Kathy, and um, I didn't know as much about you. So I'm just ex so excited to have you join the conversation today. Thank you, Kim. It's a pleasure to connect with you as well. And it's going to be a really interesting one today because obviously in, in the other episodes we've been looking at um, what do we need to think about as we move forward as an industry, as we move forward with our understanding of these wonderful animals that we work with, how can we be better at learning from the dog rather than us, these are my two favourite words, right, because I keep saying them, unilaterally, arbitrarily, deciding what we want the dogs to do. And personally, you know, my, my life just flipped on its head when I met you the first time, Sarah, and our lives kept kind of bumping into each other for quite a while. And um, I've learned so much about the art, and it is an art really, of good observations from the work that I've done with you. And, and I think this is the key, is being able to step back. And one thing that we were... Um, touching on a little bit with Chris uh, when we had Chris along last time was talking talking about the emotional experience of the of the dog uh, and what the dog has to go through and part of that is this expression of stress uh, and how we feel about stress and how we talk about stress we the, the word obviously the main word that gets pushed around a lot is the word threshold we've got to keep the dog below a threshold and for me personally I always think I wonder what people actually think threshold means. You know, is it the point at which we see a behavior? Is it the point at which that nervous system is starting to engage? Is it the point at which the dog can't cope? And a lot of these things I feel um, can, especially when we're thinking about the, the notion of counter conditioning, especially, what are we actually counter conditioning? What are we actually getting the dog to experience differently? And if we're just looking purely at that behavioral output again, what are we missing about that dog's own regulatory system, that kind of homeostatic process that a dog has to go, which invariably involves an element of stress, an element of stacking or an element of um, uh, kind of, um, what's the word, kind of a sympathetic response to something. When we look at mother nature, especially, and, and this is something you talk about, Kim, I know, we don't see dysregulation in Mother Nature because there is an allowance for that process to happen, right? So something happens, nervous system engages, nervous system backs off. It's just going through that process. So I think that's something for us to really look at, especially because with your understanding of physiology, Sarah, and your amazing observation skills and what you do through ACE, we need to hear about ACE today and definitely about free work and why free work is so important, actually, by allowing without judgment or label a dog to be able to go through an experience that we can learn from. Thank you. I think um, something really important is that people recognise that stress isn't a negative thing. It's the duration of that stress that can be problematic, but also stress can come from really exciting activities too. So again, it comes back to, for me, really good observations. And that's where I love E.D. Jane Eaton's candle analogy especially when it comes to trigger stacking, because when people mention triggers and talking about trigger stacking and the dog going over threshold, if you actually talk to people, they're breaking it down to external triggers. So for example, a dog who might be really sensitive about an off lead dog running up to them for lots of different reasons, goes out for a walk and just as he happens to get out of his door, a uh, lorry goes past, stops and the air brakes startle the dog. And then as they're continuing down the path together, the sensitive dog and his guardian, a dog maybe runs up to a front gate and barks at our sensitive friend. And then a cyclist shoot past, shoots past. And just as that sensitive dog and his guardian are entering the park, a whole group of kids shoot past, all excited because they're going to play football and they are now allowed to meet out in the park again. And then by the time that dog is enjoying maybe a calm walk in the park, or that was the goal for the guardian to set that up for their dog. An awfully dog bounces up and our sensitive dog reacts because the dog is now trigger stacked. But what people don't take into account 
is actually what was going on in that dog's internal environment before he even left his home. What was the flooring like in the home? Is it slippery? Does our sensitive friend have undiagnosed issues, let's say, with the hips? So we've got pain and discomfort, which increases noise sensitivity and touch sensitivity. And all of those emotional responses are lighting candles. And that's what E.D. Jane's concept is, talking about how many experiences light internal candles for the dog, including what the internal environment is like for that sensitive dog. So we also need to look at gut discomfort, the way the dog has to organize his body, maybe because what the guardian perceives as a really lovely sleeping option isn't that favorable to the dog because of the position of the bed, the type of bed, and maybe the dog is lacking in sleep for lots of reasons too. So if we're talking trigger stacking, that dog was trigger stacked before he even had his harness on, which could have caused uh, more candles to be lit because of the body sensitivity and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we need to keep questioning everything. And this is what I hope I really encourage all our ACE followers and students and clients to do, to keep questioning question everything I say, question everything I might teach, question everything you've learned, question your belief system, but never question the dog because the dog's always right. <laughs> I love that about questioning the belief system. I think that's really important because we all have these biases. We all have our own narratives. And, um, uh, you know, even as trainers, we have to think about our own biases and try and check them in at the door really so that we can have the access to see what the dog really needs to tell us. And I think when we think about some of the um, more traditional approaches regarding, okay, so this behavior here is the problem. So this is the behavior we saw in the park. So we need to change that behavior. Like you say, so much other stuff is just, there's so many things. That behavior is just the end bit that we happen to see. And actually I think for some of these dogs, uh, and definitely the ones I've seen when I've been up to Tilly Farm, where there is nothing else, even uh, the dogs, you can talk about more about this in, in a bit yourself, Sarah, but, you know, taking harnesses off, taking collars off, so the dog's really free to be able to maneuver around the environment. There is no external pressure coming from a training point of view. You know, there is no expectations put on that dog regarding what we need them to do in that moment while they're doing these things. Um, and I think it's, this is a really important part of this process of stepping back and thinking more about the whole emotional experience for the dog, including that internal system. Yeah. Um, because that's what the emotional experience is ultimately, because all of us in this room, we all share the same neurology, physiology, hormonal things, and we share a lot of that with our dogs, of course. What makes it unique is what is our personal emotional experience, and that's how we internally operate, both psychologically, neurologically, and also physiologically. And anxiety and excitement trigger similar responses in the nervous system. So again, it comes back down for me to that, those good observations. <clears throat> and really, and that's the whole premise of animal-centered education, ACE. It really is about giving animals choice, but also recognizing within that choice, they can only choose from the choices we've made available to them. But it also hopefully honors them and gives them a voice. And it is the individual animal that is at the center of how we might help give um, uh, sort of more layers to their, to their learning. And for me, it is about learning, not training per se, but we are building education, but we're building at a pace, hopefully to suit that individual animal, but also to really listen to maybe our own drives and desires to teach something that actually may not be rewarding for that dog. And just because we attach Food rewards doesn't make it a rewarding experience by any means. And I think actually food rewards can create a lot of conflict and can be, build a lot of frustration. And it's something that we need to always be considering. Is what I'm teaching or educating appropriate? Is it fair? Is it in the best interests of the dog? How can I shape this learning experience so that the dog can fully participate and make it clear to me when I'm inviting engagement, whether it is that in engagement he is enjoying, or is he only engaging with me because I am the only source of food available? 
And that's why in the framework of ACE free work, which we can talk about, I add learning layers because the dog can always disengage, but go back to a rewarding activity that involves access to a variety of treats within that framework. If that makes sense. Yeah, so we're inviting, we're inviting, inviting. I was going to say, you're still giving the dog choices in that environment. And that's one thing that really struck me when I did your online course, Sarah, was the power in being able to just stand back and observe how the dog wants to move, what the dog wants to engage with. When it's given free choice, I mean, it's still limited insofar as whatever you can set up. Yeah. Hopefully it's, it's um, a variety of different choices, both in terms of which food reward, if food reward is what the dog is choosing to interact with, but also the different surfaces, different heights, different levels, and then being able to observe things that are as subtle as, and the one that, that kind of springs to mind was Raven, looking at whether Raven prefers to turn left or right. Now that's a very, very subtle thing because it wasn't at all obvious and certainly wasn't anything that anyone else had seen in all of the training and observation that she'd had. And yet just being able to watch her move around and choose where she moves to illuminated that there was potentially an issue around the head and neck area, which I mean, I went on to kind of um, discover in more depth as I worked with her more. So that, that idea of giving the dog the freedom to move around um, and really choose the subtle behaviors in terms of where it places its feet, how it places its feet, which foot does it prefer to place first? And it's not that anything is good or bad, it's just yeah. literally gathering information that helps you understand like a detective more of what's going on with the dog, which I think is so beautiful. And actually, yeah, really incredible in terms of building that bond of understanding the dog in front of you rather than trying to mold it into whatever you choose it to. And picking up on the food reward thing, um, something that Jane Arden said to me once when I was um, training with her, well, she said it to the whole class was, you know, it's really interesting to watch how many dogs will choose to perform those behaviours when their owners aren't allowed to give food reward. And it's not that either is good or bad. It is just really interesting because some dogs will choose to interact anyway, whether there's food reward or not. And presumably those dogs are choosing to interact because the interaction itself is fun. Some dogs, you don't see them for dust. They're off sniffing in the corner, <laughs> no interest in you whatsoever. So that tells you something about why they're choosing to interact with you. And then just making sure that we don't fall into the trap of unwittingly coercing the dog through good intentions, but assuming that because the dog chooses to interact with us when we've got food reward, that somehow the dog is being rewarded for that. And I do think from a neuroscience perspective, dogs are incredibly social and there's something very specific about dogs. And Kim, you may be able to speak to whether we think we've bred this into them through the process of domestication where they want to harmonize with you as, as their guardian. So they want to harmonize with, you know, whatever it is that, that you want to do or whatever it is that they see that you want them to do. That's not the same as reward. And it's not bad, it's not good, but it does, um, it, it very much plays out, I think, in how they interact with you. And that choice to follow what they see you want them to do isn't necessarily the operant conditioning model that we think it is, i.e. the dog is being rewarded, therefore it feels good, therefore it chooses to interact again. It could actually be a much more higher cognitive process that involves the dog thinking, oh, this is what she wants me to do. I like to enrich my guardian's life, so I'm gonna go along with it because you know I have a strong bond with them. It's not quite the same. I mean, it's, it's vastly different in terms of neuroscience, but it's not quite the same even in its complexity of the choices that are made in those interactions. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know why I picked up on that when you were talking, but I think it is really important for us to just um, realize that food reward may not actually be rewarding, like you say. Yeah. I think it creates a lot of conflict. So sorry. Um, and also in terms of the observations in free work, it is about sort of unpeeling those layers and looking for all those small threads that weave together to create the more obvious behavior and movement patterns. 
So I just, those moments where our students suddenly recognize that they had identified their dog, carried a lot of tension, let's say round the trapezius muscles or through the trapezius. But then getting on that trail and recognizing that actually the dog's constantly shifting behind. So is the dog fixing through the trapezius and the neck because the dog's now foreloading, because there actually might be some difficulties that haven't been acknowledged behind. So one of the big questions in ACE is always, does your dog have a busy brain or, bo or body pain? Because again, it's getting people to question the belief that an active dog is pain free. And that isn't true. Obviously some active dogs are pain free, but we're looking at that pendulum swing. So a dog that has Un discomfort in the body and is uncomfortable physically and emotionally because you cannot separate those two things are either really active or really lethargic and we're asking to find that moment where that dog can return to that balance point for the greater part of the day and have this beautiful fluid efficient swinging movement where it's easy for that dog to move through all the different postural patterns including turning left and right and going back to E.G. Jane's brilliant handle analogy, one of the dogs that came to me because she was really struggling in kennels and couldn't get her home because she had enthusiastic greeting behavior. And that immediately sets bells ringing off in my head. When we've got dogs that love people and keep jumping up, my immediate thought based on pure experience is body pain or body sensitivity because the dog's carrying so much tension for whatever reason. And sure enough, as we started to do that exploration, she was really tight, but the movement pattern was really interesting and in that she only could move fluidly to the left. So she moved anti-clockwise around the room, around the free work setup. So crucially, when she was out and something was upsetting her in the environment and she was spinning and lunging and barking on the lead, her, care her caregiver, because she was habitually handling her from her left, was turning the dog away from the stimulus to her right. But what we identified was the dog couldn't turn right. So far from being a way of decompressing the dog to move the dog away from the upset, the perceived threat, it was actually lighting more candles because it was physically difficult for this dog to turn right. So she couldn't eat the reward that was offered for making that right turn. The minute we switched the handler, the dog could stand on a loose line watching all the animals that had caused the upset just the week before. She could keep breathing, stay relaxed. And when she was invited to turn left, because she's now on the handler's right side, the pace was just flowing and soft and she could immediately take that food reward. So we were lighting candles by turning her to the right instead of snuffing them out. Mm. And had we not videoed that session, we or observed that session, we might have missed that really important piece of information. And at four years old, um, the dog was diagnosed with arthritis in the neck and in the lumbar spine. And she'd also been born with a deformed spine. So again, those observations are just so helpful for so many reasons, but ultimately ACE has been created for dogs by dogs because they're the only canine experts that exist in my humble opinion. I, I am so excited to hear with the way that this conversation is going because it just expands everything we've been talking about as far as going beyond this, this operant model only, where we've been so obsessed with the question of how to change behavior. And, and the whole control and kind of that puppeteer, you know, it's my job to manipulate, whether I'm the owner or the trainer, the behavior consultant, the veterinarian, to manipulate the external observable behavior of the dog. And we're so obsessed with that question of how that we don't step back and really look at, well, why though? Like, why is this happening? And I think that's really the cornerstone of the shift. Whatever questions then we ask on the back of that, 
uh, why is that happening? And, and giving the recognition to all those invisible things that are going on in that internal environment for the dog at, at any given time, whether that be pain, whether that be hormones, whether that be something going on in the nervous system or in the animal's physiology or gut issues, as you say, there are so many things that can be strong influencers. Um, and, and also that kind of emphasis on the observable keeps us steered away, not just from those kinds of um, individual internal conditions um, from that kind of self component with the legs model that I like to use, but also that genetic piece, because there's a lot of invisible genetic influencers that are in there, whether those are shared genetic influencers, like the one you were mentioning a moment ago, Kathy, this idea of um, the, the fundamental instinctual motivation of social animals to social reference and to look for cues from others and to also feel dependent on bonds and relationship, communication, reliability of that communication, reliability of that bond, because that goes to the very heart of survival for any social animal. I'm not safe if I'm alone. That's a fundamental animal feeling. And so the kind of need for that touchstone socially to kind of ground that animal and help them navigate, like we assume, oh, it's because I'm just doling out the cookies. And yes, I can artificially shape, you know, attention to and behavior in response uh, of what I'm doing, my presence in the room, my cues, my prompts, et cetera. But even if you do nothing, even if you're not externally manipulating the behavior, you'll s still see the, the social referencing and that kind of pull, magnetic pull to that, because it goes to the very heart of what I think is the first motivator for every animal before any other motivation can enter, which is, am I safe? Safety. And that's first. It's interesting that people talk about building trust as an active component. And I never really feel like building trust is an active component. I don't, don't set up exercises to build trust with my animals. The trust just comes from the experience <clears throat> of being with who they are and being with who they are without the expectations of what they should do or how they should behave. And being able to observe at a level that is much more detailed than the level that I think we often are kind of taught to observe at. You know, very often we're taught to observe the big behaviors, if you like. So the barking, the lunging, the, the twisting around, the, you know, whatever it is. Whereas actually the information is really in the, the micro behaviors. Mm. It's really in the mm. tiny, tiny detail. So this idea that, well, if it's not observable, then you can't do anything about it. There's so much more that's observable that we're just not very good at observing. And, you know, I've been observing animals, I don't know, since I was a little kid. I was one of those that came out of the womb wanting to be a vet. And yet I did Sarah's online course last year, was it, Sarah? Well, it must have been because I had Raven, didn't I? Um, did Sarah's online course. And for the, for the first couple of sessions, I was just in awe at all of this information that I'd completely missed. You know, I'd already had Raven for several weeks by then. And yet there were just layers upon layers as everyone was jumping in with comments of more and more observations that were reproducible as in once you start looking for them you see oh yeah she does only turn in one direction oh yeah that ear is always lower than the other ear really tiny tiny observations that actually were glaringly there all the time that now I need to teach myself to become more in tune at watching and kind of almost hold myself back from wanting to influence or control I had an example with Nancy this week where she's she's very slightly changed the way that she places one of her hind limbs. And I had an internal dialogue with myself. I live on my own, so most of my dialogue's internal. <laughs> about, okay, should I now be doing something? You know, should I be putting her on painkillers? Should I be um, justifying anesthesia for imaging? And actually the, the internal dialogue that won out was, no, this is information. I just need to sit tight, watch and wait and see. There's no overt impact on her well-being right now, but this is really subtle information that no one else will be able to observe easily, but obviously Obviously I'm watching all the time. So I just need to be mindful of that and watch to see how it changes, whether it's temporary, whether it's permanent, and then that'll help inform to what extent I will or won't intervene. 
and also be mindful of, you know, in the meantime, I'm not going to ask her to do anything that is particularly athletic or that involves a big stretch of her back legs, etc. But it's quite, um, it was going against the grain almost not to act. And it made me realise how, I don't know whether it's my training as a vet or just, you know, my immersement in the dog training and, and behaviour modification world, that I automatically think, okay, now I should be acting. And actually mm. the act just to observe more detail and just to be mindful that there are more signals there that I could gather information about. I'm only going to say one sentence because I, I want to let you guys go on a tangent, but you said something, Kathy, that I just don't want to miss is that I think trust and manipulation are mutually exclusive in relationships. And I think we don't think about that. And I think that's one of the value places where we're stuck because we think that's our job is to manipulate their behavior as their handler whether that's as a professional or an owner. Like you said, we feel like you have to do something, but your passive trust building, I completely agree with that. I wish we could get out of our own way more and allow that because none of us in a relationship like to feel manipulated, right? That doesn't feel like that's trust building. This comes to the term that I, that I use, uh, which is emotional, relevant, emotional relevancy. And when we think about what that comes from, the social referencing that you were talking about, Kim, this comes back to that term relief as well, I think. And, and that example you gave, Sarah, with that dog, who just by learning from that dog that it could move easier to the right than the left. Imagine a dog who needs something from us. So they're in that situation where they're looking to us for that support of that relief or whatever they need. Uh, and then we're throwing in random operant training, which the dog's like, okay, great, this is gonna happen. And then the, for the dog to find out, well, actually I don't get any relief from that. In fact, I actually feel worse from that. And actually, if that dog could speak, Sarah would be like, hang on, it's got nothing to do about the animals because I can't turn left. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and yet somebody who wouldn't have known that would think, oh yeah, the dog's not taking the food, so they must be more stressed, let's add oh, some more distance or whatever exactly. it is. Mm. So, and um, I think what you were saying, uh, Kathy, another kind of fallout from an operant approach is operant kind of equals fast, right? We, we need to do things quick. We need to train more. We need to kind of have this notion that, um, you know, you do this, you do this, and you get that kind of output. Uh, and what we've actually got to learn more about is two things. One, slowing stuff down. That's what I've learned from you, Sarah. Slow everything down. So slow the environment down, slow the process down, give ourselves more time, give the dogs more time. And secondly, to try not to work in absolutes. So um, I'm not a vet, but I think um, you are, Kathy, and I think vets could work in absolutes. Oh, well, if I do this and the dog's okay, they, they're not in pain. Or uh, as a trainer, we think if I do this, the dog's not doing that particular behavior, so they're not anxious or they're not whatever, you know? And I think it is more nuanced than that, it has to be. And to your example there, Kathy, those two things, slowing stuff right down, not seeing it as an absolute and thinking, I'm just going to wait and see. Andrea Bean, uh, Breen says this, wait, um, uh, watch, wait, wonder. I love those, the three W's, watch, wait and wonder. And I think we just need more time for that. And, and we have to be braver as an industry to find out the best ways that we can bring caregivers into that. Which is like, yeah, we have to recognise, of course, that those behaviours are probably really irritating to that owner, potentially, to that carer, um, that, uh, you know, might be difficult for them. But that's ultimately where we get the best outcomes for the dog, when we can actually find out what relief this animal actually needs, physiologically, neurologically. And that emotional relevancy kicks in then. So emotional relevancy is about if you are in a stressed state, how relevant emotionally is that person with you? Because that's where those bonds come. That's where that trust comes from thinking, yeah, actually you are emotionally relevant to me. When I need, when I can express need, you can give me support and you can give me relief. It's important. I think what's interesting too in free work is we um, encourage the guardian or the caregiver to put the dog's favorite toys in the environment. So basically it's having lot, like kind of lots of sensory items um, starting out with less than I used to when I was first really exploring it because I discovered it's easier to add stuff than remove stuff if a dog's fearful, obviously. So we have different sensory stations such as snuffle mats, but raised snuffle mats as well, because lots of people would say, oh, my dog doesn't enjoy things like that. Question mark. Food's a primary reinforcer. 
So if a dog isn't enjoying eating from a floor or a snuffle mat, for example, we have to ask why. Is it because posturally he doesn't feel comfortable putting his head to the ground or does he not feel emotionally safe to have his head to the ground? So even having raised water bowls, hugely um, important in free work, because also our behavior around the food, uh, water bowl, sorry, is to put that water bowl against the wall for our convenience, but you're inviting an anxious dog or a dog that just doesn't feel quite safe in that novel environment, even though he will be confident in known environments, to have his head to a wall and his hindquarters exposed to people in that environment that he actually can't see. So when we move that raised water bowl into the room, it's amazing how many dogs will drink that wouldn't normally drink in that setting because of that water bowl placement. But within that setup, we also have the dog's favorite toy. And people will often say, oh, but my dog loves his ball. He's only going to want to play with his ball. So I go question mark. No dog to date has responded in free work the way the caregiver thought the dog was going to respond. It's a completely illuminating experience. And really interesting, we then start to look at when does the dog engage with that toy? And recently, when we could have people in person at the farm, a dog had access to a ball in free work. The dog didn't show any interest in the ball. The dog totally knew the ball was there. Dogs are amazing. They know everything in the environment. We don't have to kind of wave and, and make lots of noise. They, every dog knows what's available to them there. Processing is phenomenal. The dog only ran to pick up the ball when there was a loud noise because the wind had got up and some of the cladding banged against the arena. And at that point, the dog ran and grabbed the ball as a decompressor, a need to hold, an emotional response to the noise. And the caregiver had a light bulb moment. She said, this session has made me rethink how my dog feels about the environments I take my dog to because my dog always wants to carry her ball because she loved it. And now I'm realizing she needed to carry that ball because she was not as comfortable in the environments as I thought she was. Mm. So again, it's this amazing question mark because everything we would want to know about these phenomenal animals is there right in front of us. So I really teach people to sweat the small stuff, mm. stand back, to watch, to engage, explore, to acknowledge what we're seeing, and then to, to teach, to engage that dog and see at which point we might need to rethink how we do invite that engagement because of everything we're gathering in terms of observable information from these amazing beings because we can't know what they're thinking or feeling but we can start seeing these patterns because they're there yeah yeah very powerful stuff really powerful do you find um do you find that the people that come to you um to do free work are already on board with the approach that you have or have you um do you have any kind of tips or tricks for people who might be wanting to sit down and have a conversation with an owner to talk about why they might not do the classic operant approach of, okay, I'm going to teach your dog how not to jump up. We're actually now going to gather some information instead. Like how do you make that transition for owners that might not be expecting that? That's a really good question. People obviously know how I work. Um, well, not obviously, but, but I've been around a while. So people know how I work and connect with dogs. So I don't have to go through a sort of explanation process with clients or students. They, they've sought me out for that reason, for the most part. What I always did, and this was kind of like the early stages of free work, is always had that dog free in their training room when the consult would start or the behavior consultation would start and the dog would have the opportunity to engage with snuffle mats or something because of the observations as well i would say i'm going to keep interrupting you i'm going to start pointing out things that i notice in your dog's movement in your dog's responses because all these threads are linked to the bigger behaviors that you've come um to me to 
um, support you with to, to help modify. So I would start really early on saying, how interesting your dog, his right ear doesn't move. And I'm really interested in how that might link with tension that runs down through the right side of that neck maybe. Can I ask how your dog responds when you go to pick up the lead? And so we, I want the guardian to be part of that discovery process, but I also want to honor what I'm seeing. So people would often say, I'll show you what he does. I said, no, you don't need to show me what he does. Let's not give him the opportunity to kind of practice that behavior again. Let's see if we can give him a different experience, but I'm gonna just keep pointing things out. Have you noticed your dog's tail only goes to the left, for example? Those clients, students can immediately see something. So they are immediately invested in feeling successful. They see their dog quiet and relaxed and not jumping up at me or them because that dog has something else to do. Another thing to um, do in terms of engagement and gathering data from the environment, the dog can then just come past me, sniff a leg and go back to whatever I'd set out. So now it's more structured. It's just a follow on from that. And I can shape it in any way to say, if you're here because your dog jumps up, why don't we give your dog something to do that's gonna keep his feet on the floor while we talk? And, and it's about helping that person not feel judged, helping them feel heard, but totally honoring what information that dog is giving you too. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, and well, and I feel it when I speak to you about my own dogs, I feel it. I'm, I was on board with your course as soon as people started noticing stuff with the videos I was posting, because then it's immediately apparent, yeah. okay, I really wanna know what they know. I really want those skills. I want that level of understanding. And then you realize that there's, a whole dimension to the information that the dog's giving you that you've never appreciated before that and that kind of I guess for me it just meant okay there's more to learn that may actually help me help the dog um, in a way that I hadn't thought of before so yeah it's, it's a really powerful approach. And people quickly see as well that the dog might kind of dip in for that engagement and they have these amazing moments I just find them just emotional to watch where the dog and the garden go oh now it's going to happen and the dog comes in goes to repeat that well-practiced habitual I don't think it's any thinking at that point I think it's sheer response but the dog stops and the dog might step back and look and then soften and go back and re-engage with whatever items we have out in free work and the guardian's like the dog stopped himself or she made a different choice. And I'm like, I want to scream and cheer, but obviously I'm not going to do that because that might elicit a response in the dog that we obviously don't want to reinforce. And these moments happen so quickly in that free work setup because there's, there's no pressure. And also what I've noticed over the years is if we can release that dog to move at liberty around the room or the paddock or wherever it is we're connecting with the guardian and the, the dog. Um, the less likelihood is that that guardian will be tight on the lead and do what I call displacement fumbling. So even if we say, if you can keep your hands quiet, the minute you ask someone something, they need to do a displacement activity with their hands. And when it's with their dog, it's often fumbling the dog's ears or ruffling the coat. <laughs> they can't hear us. They're not in a space where they are able to process. They're not deliberately ignoring us. It's a, it's a nervous system response in them. But if we can have that dog free and the dog is much more relaxed than that guardian ever thought that guardian can also relax and the other thing that was really evident was that the guardian would share more quickly the real reason they'd booked that appointment instead of waiting till 10 minutes before the end when we got well actually the real reason we've come is but we didn't want you to judge us or you know think badly of us or or, or whatever that the trust and the connection was built so quickly with all of us because we're all a part of that moment that dog that guardian however many caregivers have come me we're all together 
and our interests collectively are in supporting that dog and supporting that guardian while that guardian is learning how they can support the dog for themselves. I mean, you're again kind of demonstrating that you're not teaching the owner something. It's not, it's not an operant model for the owner either. You're not, you're not teaching them something they don't already know. You're giving them an experience that they can then go away and reflect upon. And that has the potential to change their approach to the case on a much more profound level than teaching them, this is how I want you to do it, or I want you to keep your hands still. Um, so it's the same approach that you're describing with the owners oh, as we've been yeah. talking about for the last few episodes with the dog. So yeah, it's amazing, really good. And, and I think some of the, um, you know, one of the things I found, well, we've all found since we've been doing these chats is professionals, reaching out saying I kind of get this thing about the emotional experience but how do I how do I do this how do I learn more how do I observe more and I always point them in the direction of free work because it's, I think it's a it's going to have to be a core component of how we start thinking about things because what you just described there Sarah was uh, and I've seen it myself uh, with clients and also up at Tilly Farm for me one of the big things about free work is my own little bias, which is around processing, my doors of the brain analogy, you know, you can see those doors starting to open for that dog while they're doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been up at Tilly Farm with dogs who are very sensitive around strangers. Guess what, we've got a room with maybe 10 people in there. They'll come in and engage with the free work and then you'll start to see them think, right, I'm gonna kind of engage with this and have a little look at you, have a little look at you, have a little look at you. Then they'll break away from the free work and they'll come around to wherever they feel safe to get a bit of olfactory information and re-engage. And it's this self-regulatory element of it. And for anybody listening who's a, who's a professional thinking about how we utilize free work, um, obviously check out the ACE Facebook page. We can talk about that before we, um, we'll make sure we put some resources up with the link on this, I think Kim will be good. Mm. But um, I use free work in so many different ways. A good example is, um, dogs who struggle with with guests coming to the home so we either think about kind of using an open or even a kind of a more direct handler-led counter conditioning approach and I find almost exclusively that by getting the dog really into enjoying the free work experience then you start adding guests into the mix guests the dog might know initially so you're bring, bringing them through the dog is able to feel in control around that environment of how, how they can self-regulate and how they can process. And a lot of the time, and you, you mentioned this earlier on, Sarah, about the dog who kind of jumps up people. I hear that all the time. Yeah, my dog loves people. Um, and like I say, there could be a physiological element or just a dog who's hugely socially over aroused, who is yeah. using that appeasement behavior. They can actually be more, they, that nervous system's backed off a little bit now. We've got more doors open through that process. I, I've used free work around getting dogs uh, more comfortable in new environments. So the rescue that I work with, uh, when the dog goes into the new home, we've already started doing some free work at the rescue now, goes into the new adoption place. So there is a point of connection there and the dog can actually think, yeah, I can let that nervous system back off a little bit and let me start to process properly. Um, dogs getting used, getting, getting used to cars, getting used to being around a car. There's, there's so many different ways that we can use free work. And I think the more we can think about how we can learn from the dog regarding obviously any physiological uh, elements, which are really vital, it's got to be our first port of call, but also how that dog chooses or needs to process mm. socially and environmentally. And for when we think about what we might do with operant training, as we said before, it's not a case of just throwing anything operant out the window. It's a case of recognising if we're going to support anything, let's support something that is innately useful to the dog mm. and that is something that they do find rewarding and something they do find offers them relief I, so free I was, work is just amazing it's just um it, yeah it is it it yeah. blows my brains out and it was created by dogs yeah yeah i was thinking so much sarah when you were talking i was thinking about how our behavior center is set up because we have a consult room where most dogs are off leash in the first 30 seconds right and so save just a few very dangerous dogs who are letting me know i am going to head right to you if this leash is unclipped most of them get from my body language in the environment very quickly this person's not a threat i feel comfortable telling the owner go ahead and let the dog off the leash and the room becomes a small free workspace i've never you know not being aware 
aware of the extent of your work, never really thought about it in those terms, but it's all about that experience. And then, yeah, I think um, maybe it was, I don't remember if it was Andrew, you or Kathy who said it was that experience, but I was thinking about that real difference. And again, kind of jumping off of this whole beyond the operant concept, experience versus agenda, right? Like, so, I mean, take a human moment, right? Where you meet someone for coffee or something. You can sniff the moment you sit down. If your friend has an agenda, like some yeah. favor she wants to ask you for, you know, can you watch my dogs for a week or whatever it might be? Like, and it feels different. The qualitative experience is immediately shifted from, I'm just, here in this moment with my friend and we're experiencing something and you know I've I've appreciated the value of that environment for my own work for a long time because immediately as you say Sarah it builds rapport with the dog with the space the dog then trusts the space and then we can use that as a stepping off point for so many other things and then the owner has a very different experience most of the time one of the differences however I thought about when you were talking is unlike how people know you for the free work and most of your clients are seeking you out for that, many of my clients don't know how I operate and might come to me to have their dog fixed through kind of an operant training model. And I've really been surprised over the years how many people show no interest in what the dog is doing. Even as I'm pointing it out, I have a hard time kind of keeping them engaged because they're like, well, when are you going to do the thing and manipulate the behavior and show me some really fancy footwork? Work with your awesome dog training skills. And I'm like, I'm not going to bother your dog. This is, this is rich. This is a gold mine. I'm getting so much crucial information. And I can also then start just doing kind of free shaping, right? And just say, oh, that was lovely dog. Wow. You saw someone walk by, you went to step towards it. Instead, you stepped back, looked at the licky mat you were just using, shook off and went back to it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. That's so pretty. And then we can start talking about how, how to build on that. Yeah. But I think that the kind of operant model has trickled down to the culture. It's not just our profession, right? It's not just that we feel like we need to operantly manipulate the dog's behavior, but the culture now expects us to do that as well, to utilize the operant model. And the curiosity really is something quite foreign, I think, to most pet families. I think, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry totally hear what you're saying, Kim. And for me, that next step on in free work is helping the guardian or caregiver recognize their dog's posture when that dog's relaxed versus maybe when they first entered that space. Mm -hmm. So I could say, we don't know why your dog lunges at cyclists. We do know your dog lunges as a cyclist goes past, but we don't know what's going on inside. So I might say something like that. I said, but what we want to look for is the postural change. So mm -hmm. can you see your dog's so amazing, he's starting to relax because as he's on that licky mat, his ears are softening. And people will say, yes. So then what we start to build on Kim is then maybe bring out that dog's collar again or the harness. And we watch those ears change. Mm. We watch that speed picking up around the free work items. We recognize that suddenly the dog can no longer use the licking mat because he needs to move on because of the emotional response to just the sound of the harness, mm. never mind the sight. So again, we can go back to the candle analogy and say, look how many candles are burning mm. just because we picked up the harness. Mm. And we had an amazing dog on a workshop who was would jump out of the car and be really keen to, to go out and, and explore. We set free work out, we took everything off the dog and the dog was displaying in sort of mini form some of the more overt behaviors when the dog was out in the big wide world. So we were talking about that and looking at these patterns and the guardian was like, I cannot believe I can see micro behaviors that are you know, replicas of what we see when we're out. We brought the dog's collar out, I think, and the dog went back and engaged in the free work in the same way. Then the harness came out and was put on the dog and the dog went back to the free, fluid, beautiful movement the dog had started to be able to do in the first stages when the dog was completely free with nothing on the body. Then the, the lead came out, dog stopped, scratched the neck. 
And I went, wow, that's a really strong emotional response. That's a nervous system was why I said, but we don't know why. We're not inside your dog's body, but we do know what we've seen. Hide the lead for a minute. Dog went back to free work, picked up the lead again, stopped and scratched. So it got kind of dumped in the corner of the free work room and the dog went back to this beautiful fluid movement. And that's what I'm looking for. Where are we starting from? How can we quieten everything? Because so many guardians have never seen their dog relaxed. The dogs are starting from this level of emotional and or physical tension because there will be physical tension where there's emotional tension and vice versa. The dog was just beautiful, starting to float around the free work. And as the dog turned, the dog saw the, harm, the lead in the corner, stopped and scratched her neck again. <laughs> so that gave us such important data that we then changed the free work setup. We give dogs lots of breaks as well, lots of processing time to the kind of review mm. how they feel and to have that rest. So we don't work and work and work. We do like really short sessions um, broken down um, through, you know, maybe 10 minutes for some dogs, 20 minutes for others, but probably no more than 20, 30 minutes. <clears throat> and that's what I would consider quite a long session. So we've broken down all these sessions. And so we broke it down again. Dog had a, a rest. We moved the free work to a different location around the farm. And this time we did not get the response to a cotton line. So we broke it down, didn't use the dog's lead with the sound of the trigger snap, just threaded cotton line. And now the dog's working in free work on the line. And that was an amazing moment because paired with that, the dog didn't jump out of her car for the first time that day, um, didn't want to go and explore with keenness the environment. She waited when the tailgate was lifted and she was invited to exit the vehicle and she just stood there calmly on this loose line. So it was amazing. So again, shaping those free work sessions again puts a magnifying glass on these little areas of sensitivity going back to trigger stacking and those candles. We find what's lighting the candles long before we end up in the park where the off lead dog bounces up to our sensitive friend. I've had dogs, we, we use it as well for dog to dog introductions. And I'm really, really passionate about this for the socializer dog. Because so many times I see these setups well intentioned, well thought through in terms of distance, but the socializer dog is kind of just standing there being barked at. And that's not typical of what dogs are gonna see in the environment. I think mirroring and social drinking is really um, overlooked as really important steps to building relationships. Going back to what you were saying, Kim and Kathy, about that social need. Um, so when we have had socializer dogs, they get to do free work first. Then we have, then they leave, then we have in a separate environment, the dog who needs extra support having free work first. And we start it on the line if it's not safe to have that dog at liberty. Then we build, so both dogs are doing free work in their own areas at a safe distance. And what is really illuminating is the socializer dog can no longer eat even the dog's favorite treats which has highlighted for some of these caregivers that their dog really isn't enjoying the experience. Mm. And they would never have seen it because when they were just standing with their dogs, the dogs were just quiet, probably inhibited actually. We don't know what the physiological response was because we didn't have data to monitor that. But we can see in a free work setup, the speed is faster or the dogs are now avoiding turning in any direction that means they're gonna make eye contact with that other dog or they stop eating very specific treats that might take a little longer to chew. And afterwards, they may need that big decompressor of that big rabbit's ear or whatever it is, so they can really crunch and decompress using the back of the jaw. So again, it's this really important data gathering experience, really questioning our belief systems and how we engage with dogs that even are really familiar to us. It's it blows my brains out. It really does blow my brains out. And it excites me. That's why I share it. It's too good not to share. Yeah. 
it, it's also making me realize that what you're describing is providing an environment that enables the dog to communicate through behavior. Yeah. So one of the studies I really like for kind of um, explaining to people why behavior is quite a blunt tool to be able to monitor stress is um, the one between two different strains of chickens. So one strain of chicken, um, uh, demonstrates behavioral signs of stress and the other strain of chicken when put in exactly the same environment doesn't show any behavioral signs of stress but does show physiological signs of stress so as per heart rate blood pressure respiratory rate etc because the chickens were monitored so it's a really good example where the environment is exactly the same it's identical and the chickens are the same age they've been brought up in the same environment etc but because of their genetics, one is, has overt behavioral signs and the other has internal stress signs, so sympathetic nervous system signs, but not overt behavioral signs. Interestingly, the chickens that showed the overt behavioral signs didn't have sympathetic changes associated with stress. They didn't have elevated heart That's rate. Really interesting. I know, right? Oh. So it's a really good double dissociation. Um, and it, it's I think it's really useful for us to be able to think that behavior, you may see behavioral signs of stress and that may mean that the animal is stressed and that's great if that happens, but just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And, you know, we can observe respiration and I try to do that with my own dogs, observing the depth, the pattern, um, like you said, how easy is the respiration? So how relaxed do the intercostal muscles look, etc. But I mean, it, it, you're not gonna be able to take a heart rate and blood pressure measurement in the moment and even in the moment it's quite difficult to observe respiration if you're the caregiver and you're in a situation so but but just because the animal isn't responding with overt behavioral signs of stress actually doesn't tell us anything about no. whether the animal is experiencing stress or not mm -hmm. it isn't just about well the animal's coping it's below threshold it's actually just about potentially the difference between whether it will display overt behavioral signs of stress or not and that isn't related to threshold by the old model the animal could be way over threshold if threshold's even a thing um, and experiencing a high level of stress, but you still wouldn't see any behavioral signs. But what you're describing is kind of in the middle in that you're providing an environment where you're, you're providing the, the dog with so many more opportunities to express its emotional state through behavior that would otherwise not be open to it if it's on a lead in a park standing and looking at the other dog while it's being socialized. So it's kind of making me think that one of the things we need to be cognizant of is what environment are we providing for the animal and how much behavioral flexibility does that give the animal? Are we providing an environment that will enable it to be able to display much more subtle signs of, uh, you know, behavioral stress potentially and not to say that 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 means that the dog automatically will because as per the chicken study those chickens didn't show any behavioral signs of stress but there's a gray area in the middle where we're actually not providing an environment potentially that would enable the dog to express how it's feeling in those situations for us to be able to pick it up so there's kind of like are we able to pick up those behavioral signs and then are we actually providing an environment that allows the dog to to communicate those behavioral signs and that's why we start with um, the dog, each dog individually, so we can start getting our baseline. And something that I think is missing in most of those scenarios, uh, not free work, obviously, but in those scenarios where we might have a dog just standing next to his caregiver on a loose lead while the dog is having the experience of looking at a dog that maybe won't respond, is water. Water is never... Or not never, I can't say that, but in the setups I've observed, water was not available to the socializer dog or the dog that was um, being supported by that experience. And water is and drinking is a social thing that we do. Where do we go when we're at a party and we might not know anyone? We go and we hold that drink. It's part of a displacement activity. But you can obviously become quite dry mouthed when you're in a new situation through excitement, through a little bit of anxiety. But we don't, I don't believe we make water available enough. 
And a way a dog will drink in that situation, it might not be that deep lapping. It will be this kind of skimming with the tongue, quick laps, return, quick laps, return. And I think that's also a really important part of our data gathering process. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, Sarah, when you were talking a moment ago about the dog uh, and the transition with uh, that positive description of opening the car door and the dog just standing there and taking a moment and being much more regulated. I was thinking about the irony of the value judgment that we have on that moment, that kind of moment as trainers, reflecting on my own experience with one of my three dogs who is a very slow processor and she is it's great because she's my Pyrenees Newfoundland mix and it's just the way her brain is wired anyway is to be less concerned with my opinion of things and but I love it because she's so deliberate she takes her time with processing all information she will not be urged forced prompted etc and she's been the most humbling experience that I've ever had as a relationship with a dog because you, it's all based on trust and communication recognition of what she's doing, but I'm reflecting on the many moments in her life where you open a car door to a new environment and she stands there, often sits in the car and just, I'm looking around, I'm taking it in, I'm listening up. Oh too much sensory information, I'm gonna wait, I'm still processing, not sure how I feel about this. And, and the moments I've had, right, this kind of like imposter syndrome we all go through of like, I should get her out of the car faster. I'm failing oh, wow. as a trainer if I don't get her out of the car faster. And I've actually had many clients bring their dog to me to be like, he won't get out of the car, he's scared to get out of the car. And I'm like, and then I ask them about how long did you wait when you open the door? And they might say, oh, I don't know, like 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And, and it's really remarkable. If we just take that as an example, you're describing something that's so beautiful. What I think what my dog is doing in those moments is so beautiful, but we put this judgment on it, like make the dog get out of the car, on the command, out of the car. We've arrived where I want to be. And there could be so many things going on and we're not taking an environmental inventory of all that sensory information. Yeah. We're just forcing our agenda. And I had this just lovely moment last week when I was on vacation, took all the dogs to the beach. My Pyrenees Newfoundland, while she loved the ocean, thought all of these bloody people on the beach were just horribly scary and overwhelming and squealing children and umbrellas and carts and the whole nine yards. So I only took her in the early morning in the evening and one day I drove the car the van to the beach and parked in the parking lot and all the people I was thinking oh I'm gonna get at five o'clock everyone will be coming off the beach um all these droves of families so like four crowds of 10 were coming off the beach with all of their stuff when we arrived wow. and I knew how she would feel about it but I just decided I'm gonna open the door and just see what you think and she's like, mm -mm, nope, not even thinking about it. Nope, gonna wait till that calms down. And instead, I sat with the door of the van open for 15 minutes, just waiting and sitting there with them and talking to her about the things. And some kids came up and were like, oh my gosh, your dogs are cute and stuff. And yeah, you know, can we pet them? No, she doesn't really like meeting strangers, but you can look at her from there and we can talk about your pups at home and all that. And it really was such a wonderful experience because I waited until all the environmental stimulation dropped down, you know, 10 degrees or so. And then she kind of reassessed and I said, come on, do you want to? No, oh, I don't know. So she sat back down. I said, okay, well, I think it's gone, but take your time. And then she literally went <sighs> and just walked out of the car. And it was like, okay, now I'm ready. And we don't do that. We don't teach our clients to do that. And that's such a shame because how do we feel when we're overwhelmed and we can't process information? I think that's so important. That's such a beautiful story. And I remember someone having a very big giant breed dog that was overwhelmed by everything and she was in one of the training rooms with her dog and her dog was just lying next to her and she said I, I I need to get my dog up I need to teach my dog something I said your dog is learning everything and the learning is to be relaxed in an environment that previously would have really concerned him so you and he are connecting and learning together and this is a beautiful experience for you both we have equated learning with being active mm. and yeah. learning is um, or, be, or the art of stillness is an important mm. part of learning for all beings for mm. sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, very so I think that's what we need to help people. It's okay to stand back and sweat the small stuff. And that you're not failing as a professional because you're not manipulating enough, right? I mean, and, and this is, again, there's two sides. There's a professional side and the cultural side. The clients expect you to manipulate the behavior and feel like, well, what am I spending my money on for this hour? If you're not getting something done, showing me some progress, you know, we have so much emphasis on performance, yeah. And we continue. I mean, I just marvel at all the videos that get posted on social media, the, and the kinds of things that are like, oh my gosh, wow, that's so impressive. Look what you got that dog to do. Half of it being really arbitrary, random things that are totally not organic for the dog anyway. But it's so impressive to us somehow. It's almost like the part of us that loves watching a circus. Like, oh, that's so unexpected. It's so amazing that you can manipulate a dog to perform in this way. But it's, it, it really needs to be questioned on a fundamental basis about like, but why though? A, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, what, what is the end game? I watched a video a few days ago that people were talking about on social media and I'm watching it going, I don't even understand what she's doing. I don't understand what the trainer's goal is, why she's choosing to do what she's doing in these particular moments. I can't imagine how the dog feels. I'm a professional and I don't know, I don't know where she's going with this. But I think we so much of the time, because we feel this need to manipulate on behalf of whatever industry messages, this operant model we have, and for the benefit of the client who has those expectations of us, that we, we don't allow ourselves, as you say, to just be quiet and to watch and to wonder and to wait. Those three W's, I'm stealing that as well. I keep getting all these great nuggets I'm going to take from these little that's a t-shirt ideas. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But um, that's a whole paradigm shift. That's the paradigm shift that we're talking about. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> bringing the word value into this as well, you know, when we're thinking about teaching, does what we're teaching or what we're supporting have any internal intrinsic value to the dog mm -hmm. and that's the difference really of course between kind of like an experimental learning model which I think is what we're kind of exploring here and a structured learning model where I've decided you're going to learn this um, and I think it's, it's really important to kind of distinguish between those two things and um, what I love again about free work and a lot of the things that I've used personally on the back of free work is seeing dogs take value from what they learn because they've internalized that process in their own unique way, how they need to. And that's gonna be a much, you use the word experience, um, uh, Sarah, uh, and I think uh, it's a much better learning experience now for the animal because they've learned something about the environment, about how they can cope with the environment, about what can work regarding how they can process. This is really important stuff. So adding value, to that experience of the dog is really important. I think all of us, we could all get carried away, right? Because we all love to do stuff. And, and I think it's also important to recognize our own emotional experience in this stuff. Mm. And especially the caregivers, because, you know, uh, they have their own journey. They've been on emotionally with their own animal, with their own dog. <clears throat> but I think yeah. it's a good thing to think back and step back. Am I adding value for this, for this dog? Am I giving anything intrinsically valuable or am I just getting them to do stuff? Mm. Do you think that one of the things the dogs are learning about through free work, this is a genuine question, it's not at all rhetorical, is, um, is that they get a space where they are free to just be them without the expectation that they have to pay attention to their guardian or that they need to do something? I think that is probably a big part of it. So one of my favorite sort of ways of helping people understand the value of letting their dog explore is to not have any attachment to outcome so that uh, we have what I call the NATO approach and NATO is obviously there to increase sense of security so no attachment to outcome and it's important for caregivers too I have a very fulfilling life I have an amazing extraordinary life my life is filled with love and gratitude and great excitement, some small amount of less desirable stress, but I actually don't mind that because that is part of a opportunity to, to learn and process and everything. I still need activities where there's no attachment to outcome. It doesn't matter, I'm not meeting anyone's needs. There's no expectation for me to have completed that engagement in a 
by a, a certain time frame or even on a certain day. And for me, that's actually clearing land because if I was a gardener, which I really enjoy gardening, but I'm really not very good at it, I would have to meet certain timeframes and targets and to complete certain projects. But when I'm just clearing brush and clearing brambles and um, thinking about what new fencing we might need, doesn't matter if it takes me three weeks, 24 hours, I can start at 6am in the morning, I can finish in the summer at 10 o'clock at night. There is no attachment to outcome. No one is reliant on that outcome. I'm not offering anything that's going to make someone either feel good or more uncomfortable. It's just me, my gardening equipment or shears and that piece of beautiful wild land. So I'm in nature. I'm listening to the amazing birdsong we have around us. I'm creating a beautiful environment. So it's pleasing to me on all levels. Do I want to do that every single day? No, because then I would have an attachment to outcome because I would be goal setting that I needed to achieve something every day in order to, to move on to the next space. And I, when I'm doing things like that, I think about how important it is for dogs. We have an attachment to so many of the things that they do. And I think in free work, it enables us both to take that big breath, to push that big reset, and it also we're engaging so many different senses within free work, obviously, that it's just, I think, a more rounded experience for the dog and therefore for the caregiver too. Do you guys know about the, um, the research on the psychology of happiness and flow that they've done in the last 10 years? No, I'm trying. Yeah, really interesting stuff. And it just what you're saying really reminds me of that. But the whole psychology of happiness, there's a really good, um, I, I, there's a film they did, a good documentary on it. And I, maybe it was just called Happy, I don't remember. But, um, you know, they were talking about flow and flow being, for, from a human perspective, the moment when, say, you're doing the thing that all of us have like a thing that's like, our, like whether it's gardening or mountain biking or rock climbing or running or writing or drawing or whatever it might be, we have these things that are kind of specific to us from our own natures, really, right? The way that we just came to earth being or what have you that just feel like when I'm in this space doing this thing, I don't have to think. I don't have to employ executive function. I just find myself operating with this fluid, instinctual, organic, intuitive um, energy that, you know, people can say all day long, oh, that's woo-woo. But I mean, to me, this is this beautiful connection between, you know, nature and science and our work is all animals are doing that out in nature all the time. They're following all those intuitive prompts, when to take action and be building the nest, when to go back into the decompression and the stillness. And that self-regulation that has the space for that wonderful contradiction that values both the homeostasis and the being and the flow where you're, you don't have an agenda and you're not starting to have expectations for outcome. And yet there are other times when, you know, Kathy, it makes me think of your discussion about the brain being very much designed to predict and create expectations and to anticipate, right? The brain needs to be able to do that in order to strategize effectively to survive. That's, that's something that all animals need to be able to do. But it can't do that all the time because that's taking too much energy for to stay in executive function. And the, the brain and body are the most economical when they're operating off of emotion and habit and instinct, and particularly habit and instinct, right? Because emotion starts to take a whole different set of energy resources away. But it's, it's fascinating just listening to this discussion, how it's like, we can give room for both, right? We are not saying to kind of come full circle on the whole thing that operant is bad. We're not saying we all have to be operant, right? We all have to figure out how to interact successfully with our environment and strategize and perform for a variety of reasons. But we need to have that space to decompress and process and just do what comes to us um, in order to recharge that battery to keep going. That's and that's what I would call balance training. I know that's not what it means, but that's definitely what I would call balance training. Yeah. yeah I want my dog to learn certain skills because of the environment that he, he lives. And for him, because he had hip dysplasia, he had dietary sensitivities, he's the, the dog that really kind of brought 
free work together in a more structured approach, <coughs> excuse me, he could sit, he would offer a sit, but it wasn't easy for him because he had a need to move. And it, for me, it's about meeting that need, but starting to quieten that movement. So it's not quite so fast. It's not directed up at me. And within the free work framework, it was really evident that pause up was really meaningful to him. And I think there's a lot of things going on in the body where that slight pressure and that change is really impactful for dogs. Same with the chin rest, there's way more things going on in terms of the impact it has on the nervous system instead of being a useful husbandry technique for dogs. Because when you watch donkeys, they chin rest on each other to comfort, but also as a familiar um, engagement, they chin rest on the shoulders of their caregivers too. So I think the chin rest is really powerful and we don't know enough about it. But anyway, for Henry, pause up was really meaningful. So I just took that and then we could go outside. And when we were with the horses, he could do paws up on the rubber feed bowls. I couldn't ask him to sit and stay while I took the feeds into the field. That would not have been rewarding for Henry, achievable. It wouldn't have been fair. It would have been an unrealistic expectation. And I would have had to spend a lot of time teaching that skill and not having him with me when I fed the horses to lead, learn this skill. But taking what he was offering in free work meant I could take those feed bowls, put an empty one upside down, he could do paws up, he could maintain that because it was self-reinforcing for him. I could go out to the paddock to feed the horses. We all stayed safe. We all stayed part of that social interaction. So that's another valuable tool in free work, finding what the dog finds rewarding and easy and then taking versions of that out into different environments or for the rescue dog, taking that mini version back from that training paddock or training room into kennel so the dog can reset and actually discover the kennels as a, a relaxing place to be. Because I think, well, in that belief system in some animal welfare organisations, it's to burn off steam. I have not yet met a dog in rescue that needs more experience of adrenaline. Mm. 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 we need that reset for them. Hmm. Well, I, I know um, we could probably go on for hours. I'm about to hit the end of my time bar for our discussion today, but I want to kind of hear any, you know, last minute thoughts you guys have. I think, yeah, I just, I've had an experience just on the call. I feel really relaxed and back in tune. It's so wonderful speaking to you. And yeah, just, I could definitely talk forever. It sent my mind off into loads of different things that I'm thinking about. And the water, I, you know, I, I'd kind of considered that, but never really, you know, I'm looking now, I've got three or four water bowls around the house, which yeah. is more than I used to have, but one of them I've just moved so it's in the corner. And that's the one, interestingly, that is left the fullest for the longest. And speaking to you now, I'm like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> of course yeah. it is. <laughs> so yeah, I've learned so much yet again. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you I so much it's... for inviting me. It feels like I've come home. Thank you. <laughs> and I think for people who've kind of followed us on our little journey with these chats, I think this is a great time to have had you on actually, Sarah, because so more dots have been joined. And stealing another expression, I think, from what we, you said about balanced training, uh, Cathy, when, when, when I think about Lima, right, this is true Lima, right? This is the true least in, um, invasive, minimally aversive thing, right? Because even using, um, positive reinforcement, there is a lot of uh, kind of manipulation that goes on this. This is, this is true Lima really, which is hardly any intervention at all. It's just letting the dog tell us stuff and, and to be. I heard you say that a lot, Sarah, when I first saw at Tele Farm, you know, let the dog just be. What's wrong with that? And it's been great. Fact, it's been amazing today. Yeah, I really like that when you say, you know, the dog was invited to turn to the left or invited to turn to the right. It's just a slight change in lexicon, and yet it's so much more meaningful than, you know, get your dog to turn to the left or get your dog to turn to the right. 
Yeah. And it, interestingly, then it removes it from a, the person is either good at training or bad at training. Because yeah. if you've invited, it's up to the dog whether they move or not. That's nothing on your skill level, right? Whereas as soon as you say, get your dog to turn to the right, if the dog doesn't, then somehow does that mean that I'm not good enough at training or yeah. I don't have a good enough bond with my dog? Or well, my dog's got a problem. Yeah, yeah well, my dog's yeah. got a problem. Yeah, but he keeps doing a bunch of lookaways, so he's ignoring me and being stubborn. <laughs> right. Well, this is really unfair because that last little conversation, Kathy and Sarah, we could do another hour on that. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> that is so important, isn't it? So maybe we need to think about getting Sarah back. I think that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been a blast to meet you and to bring you into this conversation. It really is a movement. I mean, this this moment that we're all sharing right now. And in the industry as a whole is exciting because it feels like things that have been out on a limb are finally finding their way to the center of that tree and, you know, kind of going even down into hopefully the roots of our industry and we'll continue to do more beautiful things. Joy to connect with you, Kim. Thank you. And always yeah. a pleasure, of course, to connect with you, um, Andrew and Kathy. You right. guys have a great day and en enjoy. Right. I hope what I hope is as beautiful weather there as it is here. It is. It kept the sun kept coming in and yeah, even yeah, it's me. Good. So, yeah, hurrah! <laughs> we'll do it again. Yeah, Thanks. definitely, definitely. Thanks, ladies. Thank Good you, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.